All right, moving on with Perfect Movie June, <laughs> which should be Japanese horror. Whatever, I said I'm extending it to July. I was just in the mood to, to watch this. To me, this is Tarantino's perfect masterpiece. As Brad Pitt says at the end, I think this just might be my masterpiece. And the score is phenomenal in this film. And especially the end score, when that kicks in after that line, phenomenal. Now, I remember seeing this movie in theaters when it came out. I saw it with my father the first time, because we heard there was a new Tarantino movie. I think I told him. We ended up loving the hell out of this. And we ended up bringing a friend to watch it again. And then I saw it with a friend again. <laughs> I saw this three times in the theaters. This is a long fucking movie. It's two and a half hours or so. So don't be surprised if this gets long. God, the, the acting in this film, the, the cinematography, the story, the editing, the, everything is just fantastic. We have Brad Pitt. We have <laughs> Christoph Waltz, who just on him. That's what blew me away, like, the most, the first watch of this in theaters. And everyone was talking about it, like, out of the theater, like, everybody was talking about his performance. This guy is unreal. One of the best performances of the decade, for me, of the 2000s, when I saw him, especially when he breaks out into Italian <laughs> in that hilarious scene later on, I'm like, oh my god, man, like, Tarantino hit gold, with this guy. He used him again with Django Unchained, which I'm not the biggest fan of. It's all right. Not a big fan of that. I'm not a big fan of The Hateful Eight. Death Proof's all right, too. Those are my lower tier Tarantino movies. Everything else Jackie Brown, Reservoir Dogs, Kill Bill 1 and 2, like, all amazing. True Romance, he wrote the script for. All the films that he wrote the scripts for. Tarantino, it takes a lot for him to do wrong for me. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, loved it, but we'll talk about that then. Let's talk in Glorious Bastards from 09. I can't think of the girl's name who plays Shoshana. Laurent? Something Laurent? Can't think of it. Amazing job. Michael Fassbender is amazing in this. We have Samuel L. Jackson gives uh, the narration when he's talking about the, the film tape and stuff like that, how it sets on fire real fast. Tarantino has such a knack for casting his films. You got Mike Myers in here, which is such a funny scene. Like, the cast, it goes on and on, and the performances are all just amazing. Chapter 1, Once Upon a Time in Nazi-Occupied France, 1941. Just this whole opening scene is fantastic. It draws you right in as soon as Christoph Waltz, Hans Landa, which is a great name too, man, shows up at the, the French people's farm. And he's looking for the Jews. And just the dialogue, man, which is, of course, Tarantino's expertise. In a way, I said this in Pulp Fiction, the problem I have with him is almost all the dialogue sounds like Tarantino. Here, it's not as bad for me. It's never really a bad thing. But you do notice it. But once Christoph Waltz comes here to the farm, when I saw this in theaters... I was instantly captivated by this guy. Just his mannerisms, the way he asks for the glass of, the, of milk, the way he drinks it, the way he holds it afterwards, and just <laughs> everything, his mannerisms, just what a brilliant actor. And it's sad that he was acting, in, you know, whatever, was he, uh, Austrian? He was in a lot of films until this, and then he broke out in America. What a shame that it took this long because this guy is just unbelievable. A lot of this is going to be talking about Waltz. Might be my favorite character, Hans Landa, in a, in a Tarantino film. Almost definitely. I mean, Jules comes close from Pulp Fiction, and Jackie Brown <laughs> comes close in that. But God, he's so good here. And he, the way, he's so calculated. He's so intelligent, this guy. That just how he switches, let's switch to English and stuff, so the people hiding under the floorboards... The Jews, they can't understand what they're talking about. Just everything with that. And when he's, <laughs> when the farmer asks, Can I, you mind if I pack my pipe and smoke my pipe? He's like, no, you mind if I smoke mine? And he pulls out this big-ass pipe. That's hilarious. It's Senor Lapadit. The Jew hunter. Hans's whole speech about rats and how the Jews are like rats to him. And that that's how he got the name Jew hunter, because he's amazing at finding and killing Jews. And 
he starts comparing rats to squirrels and saying like rats they, they disgust people and stuff like a squirrel can easily carry the same disease and all of that he's like but you still have this disdain towards rats so you don't have to squirrels so good like <laughs> The dialogue is just excellent. His demeanor just changes, and he's so serious, like a death stare, saying, you're sheltering enemies of the state, are you not? And just the t you can see this guy is so conflicted that he doesn't want to do this. But what's the alternative? He's going to kill him and his whole family, all his daughters, this guy. So he's got to do it. And just the fact that Londa knows that they're under the floorboards, without looking or anything. He just says, you're hiding them under the floorboards. He says, yes. And uh, then they come in, the guards, and they just shoot down there. Shoshana escapes. And then just the whole shot of him pointing the gun, and then, oh, oh Shoshana! Brilliant opening scene. The acting is just off the charts. The set dressing and the costume, the outfit, all of that is so good here. Like, it looks so genuine. It looks great. All the Nazi uniforms, all... Everything, every piece of clothing that any character wears is great in this. Chapter 2, Inglorious Bastards. The whole character of Aldo, played by Brad Pitt, excellent performance. So good, I love his character. What is he, from Tennessee? Can't pinpoint his accent, I'm pretty sure it's Tennessee. But his whole speech, I'm saying, <laughs> we're doing one thing, one thing only, killing Nazis. And then saying about the scalps, and I want my scalps. And the German will talk about us. And the German will fear us. <laughs> so many quotable lines here. Now we have Eli Roth here, which I know he's very divisive. I very much love Eli Roth, most of his films. And just as a, as a dude, even though I get a feeling he's a dick, some of you will get that. He does a great job here, too. And he's made a great friendship and long-lasting friendship with Tarantino. By the way, anyone who's a Grindhouse fan, Planet of Terror and Death Proof, the Thanksgiving uh, tr fake trailer that Eli Roth put in there, it's finally happening. <laughs> he's finally making Thanksgiving. I can't wait. That was the best part of the whole Grindhouse experience for me, was that trailer. And now we're getting the film. Can't wait for that. But he's great as the bear Jew. And then at the end, when he's just gunning down Hitler and he's just mutilating his face with bullets. Excellent. And I love, I'll, I'll mention this later. Hugo Stiglitz is such a great character. And then when they show that scene of him just killing all the Nazis, he shoves his like old fist and arm down his throat, stabs the other guy through the pillow. Great stuff here. Samuel L. Jackson doing the narration here, giving the history of him, of Hugo Stiglitz. I love the sound here. I'm pretty sure it's in this movie, right? Or I'm thinking of a Rob Zombie movie. Let me wait until I hear it. Yeah. The two power chords that they play right before the music that goes, -da -da, that's from a Rob Zombie film, too. The House of a Thousand Corpses. Makes sense that both of them, they're friends, and they're huge film buffs, huge horror buffs. So it makes sense if it's an homage to something, because I don't recognize it, except for in this film and in House of a Thousand Corpses. But I, it sounds identical. We ain't in the taking prisoners business. We're in the killing Nazis business. I love when he's making the German soldier point out on the map, like where the other uh, Nazis are. And he won't do it. But I love when Aldo says to him, like, if you ever want to eat a sauerkraut sandwich again, <laughs> that's great stuff. And then the bear Jew comes out. Great scene. Just bashes this guy's head in. <laughs> He's making baseball references. And then the one soldier, they let go. <laughs> Soon as they ask him, he points right to the map. <laughs> just doop. He just saw this shit. He's not getting his head caved in. <laughs> like, no way. This guy is just immediate. Fuck that. I'll go with ratting everybody out. And, I mean, it sucks, because even though he did that, he still gets the SWAT sticker carved into his head, which is just an excellent setup for the ending. I imagine when the war is over, you're going to go home, take off that Nazi uniform of yours. <laughs> well, that I can't abide. So I'm going to give you something you can't take off. Chapter 3. I can't tell you the name, because as soon as it hit the title card, it switched to a commercial. <laughs> But it's in June. Yeah, Melanie Lawrence is uh, Shoshana. She does so good in this. I forget who it is, but the guy who plays uh, Frederick Zala. Great, too. Like, no one does bad in this movie. I can't make that clear enough. <laughs> the performances are off the walls here. 
their conversation's great when they're sitting in the uh, restaurant and he starts saying who he was and he was in a bird's nest. He was up against like hundreds of Nazis and he killed them all. He survived. So he's a hero in Germany. And she says they should make a film about you. And he's like, they did. <laughs> great stuff. This segment though, like this chapter, this is where the, this is the only fault I can give this movie. It slows down for me here. This chapter is my least favorite. There's still a ton of great stuff. But this is the low point of the film for me. I mean, Londa's whole um, meeting with Shoshana in the restaurant, and then uh, don't forget La Creme. With <laughs> All of that is fantastic. The beginning of the chapter, though, I don't really care for Zoller and Shoshana's little dynamic here, that he's just obsessed with her. She doesn't want anything to do with him. It doesn't really work for me, so it's whatever. Speaking of commercials, I just saw the Indiana Jones trailer, the new one. My heart goes out to the few friends of mine I know are seeing it today or are seeing it soon. I don't know how great an 80-year-old Indiana Jones flying around and shit could be. It doesn't seem like it's good. So my heart goes out to you guys. The actor who plays Goebbels, fantastic too. Hitler, Goebbels, Nazis all want to show Zoller's film, Nation's Pride, at Shoshana's cinema that she owns. They got to doll it up, make it look all Nazi-ish. Put fucking SWAT stickers everywhere. But what choice does she really have? She can't say no. Now, this is interesting. I never noticed this. Someone tell me if I'm right here. I'll probably Google it already before anyone sees this. When uh, Hans Lander comes and they're, you know, Goebbels and they're all sitting there talking about the cinema, he puts his arm or whatever on Shoshana's shoulder and introduces himself. And she gets the flashback of her running in the beginning of the movie. The music that's playing is from the entity. Like, I'm almost positive. Like, and I just did a, a podcast episode on it, so it's fresh in my head. That dun, 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 industrial sounding, like, track has to be. So someone let me know, but I'll already know, probably. Now, a question that I always go back and forth on with this, especially in this scene. Does Hans Landa remember Shoshana? Does he remember, does he know that that's her? Like that child who got away on the farm. Because right when he's about to leave, he says there was something else he wanted to ask her. Uh, then he pauses and he says, but for the life of me, I can't remember. So is he messing with her? And he does remember her? Or did he really just blank on what he was going to say? They never explain it that I know of, that I can remember. But... I'm going to lean with he knows. I mean, this guy's so calculated. This guy is brilliant. I mean, he's a fucking Nazi. Still brilliant. I mean, some of the best scientists in the world that we took from Nazi Germany after the war. I mean, we stole all of them. For how brilliant and calculating a character that he is, I'm going to assume he knows. And he's just messing with her. I don't want to say that nothing gets by this guy. Because we all know how it turns out for him in the end. So he didn't think of everything. He doesn't think of everything. He comes pretty damn close, though. Then we get the awesome narration again by Jackson talking about the nitrate film, how it burns three times faster than paper, and her and her projectionist, Shoshana, and uh, whatever his name is. I don't remember his name. They're going to burn down the theater. Just get all the nitrate film, get all the Nazis inside. It's a great idea. Like, it really is. This is such a good idea. Like, imagine if the war actually ended the way it did in this movie. I think things would be pretty much the same. If not, maybe better. This is a, a great ending that he concocted here. Same with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. With the whole alternate history with the Manson family and stuff. Great in that, too. Chapter 4. Operation Kino. When I saw this and saw Mike Myers, he, he's still out he's still of place here. Like, I don't know. He only has such a short role for like two minutes. It's Mike Myers. I'm always going to see him as Mike Myers. So it's just hilarious seeing him any time I watch this. Seems like we have all our eggs in one basket. What do we do? Blow up the basket. <laughs> it sounds just like Mike Myers. It's so hard to see him as anything else. Bridget von Hammersmark. <laughs> yeah, that's her name. Diane Kruger? Is that who plays her? Excellent job, too. Man, I can't say enough about the characters in this film. 
everyone is intriguing. Everyone's interesting. They're so well developed. The whole uh, bar scene in the basement. And Aldo comments and says, you know, there's a lot of you know, negatives of fighting in a basement. For one, you're fighting in a fucking basement. <laughs> Great stuff. But that whole scene, and it goes on a long while. This is like a 15-minute scene or something. The dialogue is fantastic. The acting is brilliant. The, the suspense and the tension is through the roof. Like when they're playing the card game, uh, then the Nazi... Uh, soldier like lieutenant whatever he is he comes over and he's playing and then will uh what was it hillcox that uh fastmander his name in this yeah hillcox he ends up giving it away when he orders the three drinks i you know that's the american three he's, three would be like that gives himself away that whole scene the tension is fantastic that german officer though he's great at that card game Ghost stiglitz is a beast man they're all shooting each other he's stabbing someone in the back of the neck Great. I love his character. So, Hammersmark is, I think that's how you pronounce the name, whatever, is shot in the leg during the whole Mexican standoff. And I love how uh, Aldo just sticks his finger in the gunshot wound and pushes in just to test her so she can admit if she caused all this, that she's a traitor. But she's not. And she ends up, they end up thinking of the idea of attending the gala as Italians. She asked, could you guys speak any other language than English? And I love how Aldo says, I speak the most Italian. <laughs> and then he goes down and uh, the bear Jew, uh, Eli Roth, speaks a second. And then uh, Dominic De Coco, <laughs> he speaks the least. And he does the best in that scene. Then they find out Hitler himself is going to be at this premiere. And man, could you imagine that opportunity? Yeah, the whole Italian scene is one of the best scenes in this movie. <laughs> and like I said, when I saw this at theaters, the whole crowd started cracking up once he broke into Italian, Christoph Waltz. Everyone <laughs> started laughing, clapping. What a great theater experience this film was, by the way. Multiple times, as I said. But just Aldo's Ariba Derci. <laughs> so good. And uh, then Antonio Margheriti, that... Eli Roth's character says his name is is a horror director, Italian horror director. I did not know that when I first saw this film in 09. I like I loved Argento and Bava and Fulci. I never really dove into Margariti stuff, but great little reference here to uh, Antonio Margariti. Now, one thing I never understood, I mean, I get it. Her family was murdered by this guy, by Hans. She splices that section into the film like in the last act, to cue to burn the place down. And it's just her face, and it looks cool. Wizard of Oz-ish, in a way. And you just see her face after the screen comes down and everything. But why put that there? It's just going to tip them off. Like, before the, they burn the place down, that they're in a trap. So why even put that? Just like, during the movie, just light that shit up and get out. <laughs> That's one thing I never understood with that. Gorlami. The whole scene with Hans and uh, Hammersmark with the shoe that she left behind at the bar in the basement. And he puts her on the foot and says, you know what they say, if the shoe fits, and then strangles her to death. That's great. I'm pretty sure I read, if I remember right, that that's Tarantino's hands that are strangling her in the close-up shots. Pretty damn sure that's his hands. I love when Hans takes Aldo and... <laughs> what is it? The, the little man... <laughs> That he calls him the guy who plays Ryan in the office. Uh, Novak is his last name, I'm pretty sure. BJ Novak, that's it. I knew it was a B. When he brings them in, I mean, good for him to think up this plan. You know, like, join the Americans, get immunity from all the atrocities you've done, and end the war tonight. I take that deal. He talks to the whole leader of this operation, Aldo's, uh, you know, higher up. Makes the deal for himself, plays on Nantucket Island, <laughs> and they end up handcuffing them. Hans takes them to the, you know, to the enemy lines. They let him out. They switch. They handcuff Hans. He's, he's not really necessary. <laughs> and then he just shoots the guy that's with him. And he's just like, no, I'll probably just get chewed out. I've been chewed out before. <laughs> Great line. And uh, then... The whole thing with when you get to your place in Nantucket Island, you're going to take off that SS uniform of yours. And then just, man, he looks in agonizing pain when he's, that's such a great effect too, when he's carving the swat stick in. 
fantastic. And then just the line, you know, I think this just might be my masterpiece. Cue the music, fantastic. A little egotistical of Tarantino throwing that line in at the end. I mean, for me, it is his masterpiece, so I'm fine with it. But I can see people thinking that's his ego speaking up, and I'm sure it is. But he had a, probably a good feeling about this film, and for me, works 100%. And Glorious Bastards, 09, masterpiece of a film. Love it. Ringu, Spiral or Ringu 2? Because they're both like alternate sequels to Ringu tomorrow. So take care, guys. Have a good night, day, wherever you're from. I'll talk to you soon. I love what he's making. The, the German show just saw this shit. He's not getting his head ca caved in, but he's he's not getting his head ca he's not getting his head caved in. He's not getting his head head. <laughs> Why is it so hard to say that? The guy, I forget who plays um the hell's his name. Come on, tell me. He was in a bird's nest against like 200 Nazis. He won. And she says you should, you should make a... They should make a... Well, this is a commercial. I just want to give my hearts out to... Uh, I have one heart. And I just saw the Indian... Why can't I speak? Well, I mean, Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz-ish. Cool. Wizard of Oz. Fuck you.